lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Doing okay. How are you? Pretty good. Yeah. So what are we drinking on over here? Uh, just a whiskey sour wow. that I forgot to add the bitters to. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you may say it's just a whiskey sour, but it's a pretty high end whiskey sour. <laughs> like this, this wasn't just pour some mix and some whiskey and call it a whiskey sour. No, no, that's that's true. I squeeze my own lemons. Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> and and high end cherry in there. Like that's we're not we're not looking at the radioactive looking cherry. Oh no, that no, you... <laughs> the, the candied cherries or whatever the people call. Um, yeah. What maraschino? maraschino yeah, yeah. yeah. The uh, artificial maraschino cherries. <laughs> yeah, the, I don't know why they call them maraschino cherries. I hate those things. Like, yeah, it's just not not even a natural color. Yeah. Um, I don't yeah. understand why people use those. I don't. I don't. Yeah, I don't get it. Uh, um, these, no, these are Luxardo. These are <laughs> these are like the creme de la creme of of cherries. Of cherries, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, it, you can tell it in the drink. It makes the drink. Yeah, and uh, I used a uh, Jack Daniel's single barrel. I usually I usually I use a rye whiskey. Oh yeah. Um, when I particularly when I mix sours, but most cocktails I usually use a rye whiskey. Yeah. Um, but I've I don't know. There's something about the Tennessee whiskey in a whiskey sour, particularly. That yeah. I, it just seems to fit. It's just right. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, but I did I did forget the bitters. Yeah, well, it's still very tasty. I, I made my own um, syrup too. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, Demerara sugar—that's that's the way to go. Like yeah. one and a half to one. Yeah, it's like I, I guess they call it a semi-rich uh, simple syrup. Okay. So there, there's like a rich simple syrup where you use twice as much sugar as you do water to to mix. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is hard to do actually because. Like you have to heat up the water to it's essentially to like a super saturation of, of <laughs> yeah. sugar in the water. Yeah. I think it's too much and it's too thick. Yeah. Um, but like just your normal simple syrup that's one to one, it's not enough. Yeah. So you just you go in between. Hmm. One and one and a half to one. One and a half to one is the right ratio. Yeah. You still have to heat up the water, but yeah. it you don't sit there stirring trying to get it all to mix <laughs> for like an hour. Right. Uh and, oh. And just it's, dissolve. It's, it's not. Yeah, it's it's easier to pour. Yeah. Um, because yeah, like I use uh, like oil, um, like oil and vinegar type bottles. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the ones with the little for, spigot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for the syrups, I do. Um, so if you use the like the really thick syrups, it just it won't pour like out, of there. out of there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna be here all day to get this out, <laughs> and who wants to take that much time? Yeah. So anyway, um, I like sours, man. I'm good at sours. Yeah. Uh, like I said, I love them. Like yeah. this, this is a this is a very good drink. Well, thank you. Um, I, I actually thought that we would start off with this press act. Thing. Okay. Uh, I find this interesting, and I like I had looked into it before, and I didn't think much of it. Um, but they brought it up like a week ago on uh, No Agenda. And I can't figure out what's going on with it at this moment that they brought it up. Yeah. Exactly. Because I think Jim Jordan's house, right? He's not Senate. I think, I think he's in the house. Because, yeah, quote they played a clip that. of Jim Jordan asking this um, reporter about it. And anyway... So, but what they were talking about, I was like, no, I got to look this thing up again. Like maybe I missed something because it was introduced in December and it passed the house in like January yeah, um, or February. So it's been, it, it's Couple been sitting in the Senate all this time. Like it was introduced and read in the Senate and went to committee. And that's as how far long, as I know, that's long, where it is. How long can they sit like that? Uh, forever, essentially. Really? I mean, yeah. I don't think that there's any kind of real time frame on it. Okay, so um, they can pick it back up like a year later or whatever. Yeah, I mean that's kind of what they did with the uh, Patriot Act. Yeah, yeah, right. This thing been sitting there <laughs> like stalled out forever. And... Yeah, I mean I, I assume that it had been introduced before and they were finally able to push it through after nine yeah, eleven. Yeah, I don't I don't know exactly the pathway that it took, or if it was just something that was written that they were waiting for a reason to introduce it 
that was my that was always my understanding but it could have it could have been introduced and like i say they just saw the window yeah i don't know anyway um this is the protect reporters from exploitative state spying act oh well that sounds good um i mean we want that right sure um (laughs) all right it uh it's prohibits the federal government from compelling journalists and specified third parties and <coughs> their, their specified third parties are like uh, telecom companies, social media companies, um, essentially third party services that would hold records of the journalist. Yeah. Okay. Right? Um, it, anyway, it prohibits the federal government from compelling the journalists and these specified third parties from, uh, from forcing them to disclose, compelling them to disclose um, protected information, except in limited circumstances. Okay. All right. And of what course, are the limited circumstances? <laughs> the limited circumstances are such as yeah, um, a uh, like terror, like a um, how did I'm trying to think of how they how they uh, stated it and I didn't write it down. Like imminent terror threat. Yeah. Imminent terror threat, yeah. imminent violence. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, which really means that they can ignore it kind of any time. They Whenever feel they like feel it. like it. Yeah. yeah. Whenever they feel like pushing it. Yeah. But here's why I'm irritated about this. First off, they're um, protecting these companies from being compelled by the government to disclose in private information. Yeah. And it is actually it's like particular information that they're not that they're being protected from being compelled to disclose. It's not even like everything. Oh yeah. All right. Um but from my perspective and I I think most constitutional scholars and lawyers and so forth uh who are honest yeah. um that's what the 4th amendment is. Yeah, right? Well. Yeah. Do, do we need to pass more laws to, to enforce the Constitution? Yeah. It, so essentially, to me, this looks like legislation to give Fourth Amendment protections to journalists. Yeah, right. <laughs> Specifically. Specifically. <laughs> that's the other problem. Yeah. But, um, you know, to start with, the, the Fourth Amendment is supposed to give you securities in your private um, communications uh, from any kind of... Well, it's supposed to secure your privacy and communications from the government without a warrant. Yeah. So if they don't have a warrant, they should never be able to access any of this stuff anyway. Yeah. And, of course, the warrant has to have all those things that are specified in the Fourth Amendment. Yeah. Um, you know, you, there has to be uh, the the uh, claim under oath or affirmation. There has to be... I mean, there's a big list. In fact, I'm going to pull it. I'm just going to read... The Fourth Amendment it might take me a second to pull this up, right. um, because it's that's really what this this law seems to be doing, t- as far as I can tell, is giving Fourth Amendment protections to journalists, and they should already have them. There, there's no need for a um, legislation to um, to protect a constitutional right. Yeah, well, the Constitution it's, it's, it's does the, that. Yeah, well, it's <laughs> the same thing. They've done this with the Second Amendment too. Right, like states have like passed laws like like reinforcing the Second Amendment. Mm-hmm. Which I mean, at the state level, like I'm kind of okay with it because at the state level, they're trying to protect you from the federal government. Sure. Um, and I can kind of get down with that. This is a little suspicious with it coming from the federal government. Yeah. So the Fourth Amendment says. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Right? And yeah. and notice that it's and. And, and, and. That means yeah. all of these things have, have to be to true. Apply. Yeah, absolutely. And... I, I understand well, that, that things have changed. Like the world is a different place from when this was um, when this was written. So they don't say that your your information in the cloud <laughs> yeah. is protected. 
yeah. but that was the intent. That is the idea, the spirit behind it. Yeah. The whole idea was that, that all of your private writings and communications are to be protected. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Even now, if they're not on paper anymore. It, it makes me wonder if maybe that the reason we're not just leaning on the Constitution for this and we want to pass some kind of special legislation is specifically for the carve-outs. Um, as far as like, well, you know, because the the Constitution doesn't say anything about intimate terror threat. Right. You know? Yeah. Um, so maybe that's what this whole deal is, is, well, we, we need a way to scapegoat this when we want to. Mm-hmm. And the way to do that is to pass some legislation, never mind the Constitution. Yeah, but that doesn't work either. In our legal system, the Constitution is the supreme law. Well, <laughs> so the legislation doesn't override the Constitution. The Constitution it's, doesn't provide that carve out. Therefore, that carve out does not exist. Yeah, but until it goes to the Supreme Court and gets overturned, yeah. it's it's that's the law that's enforced. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it, it shouldn't work that way. That's not how the system was designed to work. But yeah. we both know that's how it does work. And here's the other thing is that um, they're talking about this in terms of uh, the First Amendment as well and press freedoms. Yeah. But press freedoms isn't journalist freedoms. I This is one of the... This is That's like, another one of those things where people like to conflate it because they... they the we are the press like yeah. the people are the press yeah well the the press in the in the first amendment refers to um essentially distribution yeah right yeah. they they were talking about the printing press at that time they didn't mean a group of people with a particular profession yeah with a yeah <laughs> they, they meant with the a ability, J school license <laughs> yeah they meant the ability to disseminate the information shouldn't be infringed by the government yeah right um so as far as I'm concerned, what they're doing is they're creating a class of people called journalists. Yeah. Which I'm sure soon that you'll need to have a license mm-hmm. and so forth. But I consider what we do journalism. Oh, it is. Like, I mean, it's, I mean, it is. Yeah. I mean, um, I don't, I don't. Now, I'm not, I'm not out there researching this stuff myself in the sense of, like, I'm not an investigative journalist. But I would say that I'm more of a journalist than this girl whose name I forget who's been up in front of Congress talking about that because she was a newsreader. Yeah, right. <laughs> she was being told what to say. Yeah, I, she's a little more than that. I, that's unfair, probably. But well, in a lot of cases, it's not though. But you know, there's a lot of these talking heads on the major networks that call themselves journalists. That yeah. all they do is read off a prompter. They don't do any of their own research. Yeah. They just read what's told to them. I at least go out and read people that are out there in the field digging stuff in, information up. Yeah, and try and amalgamate it and give it out in in ways that people can understand that they wouldn't hear otherwise. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I think that makes me more of a journalist than most of those new news readers. Yeah, that's fair. Including the nude readers on <laughs> Naked News. Does that still exist? I wonder. Uh, I heard it does. I haven't. I'm, I, I've, they should be called nude readers. I don't know if they are, readers. but that, that, <laughs> yeah. that's what they should be. Uh, um, anyway, so yeah, those are my two issues with it. First off, you there's no reason to legislate the Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment is part of the Constitution. It stands above any legislation. It's already there. And it protects all of us, not just these people with this particular profession. Yeah. And the idea of creating a carve-out for these people with this particular profession is in itself absurd. Yeah. Because it should protect everybody. Like, these are natural rights that were codified in the Bill of Rights, and there shouldn't there should be no legislation required to enforce it. Yeah. No, I agree. Um, so yeah, that's my we'll, rant about we'll, the press act. <laughs> we'll have to follow it and see where this is going. Yeah. Um, um, see if it actually gets passed or not. I'm trying and to what think what the implications are if it does. Yeah. I'm trying to think of what, I'm trying to think of what the, the no agenda, um, theory is was about the purpose Uh, it had something to do with like essentially forcing disclosure of um, Of, sources sources, yeah Yeah. well which may be yeah i mean that would make sense Uh, you know certainly the government gets very unhappy when information about their wrongdoing that they don't want public becomes public yeah they don't have as much trouble with it when information about their wrongdoing that they want public becomes public yeah because then it was sanctioned 
Yeah. Like there, there's the, there's a huge difference in the way sanctioned leaks and unsanctioned leaks are handled <laughs> yeah, exactly. in this country. Yeah. Um, but uh, on that note, actually, <laughs> now that uh, that Biden actually, I guess Biden has been convinced that maybe his ability to beat Donald Trump again is in jeopardy. <laughs> um, well, well, the polls would certainly indicate that. Yeah, but you I mean know, they're pretty neck and neck. But he's he's kind of. He seems to be an arrogant fellow, this yeah, Joe Biden. Imagine that. Yeah. I mean, not to say that Trump is. Yeah, Trump, and Trump who's is not too. arrogant at all. There's <laughs> no, no, no. I, no I air of arrogance I, there. I'm not trying to create a contrast between these guys. It's a yeah. similarity, not a contrast. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, but it seems that maybe some people have actually, have finally gotten in. I keep saying actually, I'm trying not to, sorry. Right. Um, have finally gotten into Biden's ear and convinced him that, yeah, he might lose. Yeah. <laughs> and so now he's pulling out all the stops. And one of the stops that he pulled out is that he's um, considering dropping the charges against Julian Assange. Oh, really? I have not heard this. Oh, he won't. No. Well, I haven't even heard that it was on the table. <laughs> it, it was just one of those. It's, it's in the realm of, I will say anything, just give me your vote. Well, I mean, he's absolutely in that mode right now. Um, if you look, because I heard... Heard something the other day that he's talking about closing the border, which would be a step in that, like, like please vote for me. I'm trying to fix this problem I created. Um, and yeah, I've also, had three years to do this, and I haven't. But now yeah, that my yeah. couple re-election of months, is in jeopardy, <laughs> yeah, whatever, whatever makes you guys happy. <laughs> whatever's going to get me votes. Mm-hmm. Um, same thing with getting tough with China. Mm-hmm. Um, the I know you had mentioned something about this, but the... Um, I had heard this week that he's wanting to do some kind of tariffs on Chinese steel. Mm. Um, and that's the same thing. Like he's just, he's, it's almost like he's like running to the right of trying to get to the right of Trump. <laughs> yeah. Which is just weird. Uh, both sides have been protectionist for a long time though. Yeah. Um, the, the left is protectionist cause they want to protect the unions. Yeah. Which and- is what this, he was at some union, thing when he oh, announced yeah, well, us. Of course. So, I mean, it, yeah, that's not a coincidence. So. Well, we'll get back around to that. Uh, let's talk at least briefly about Israel and Iran. World War Three. I hope not. Well, I obviously hope not, too. Biden did at least come out and say, hey, look, if you attack Iran, we're not going to go with you. <laughs> <laughs> and then they turned around and like did it right oh yeah israel attacked attacked iran this morning was it this morning or yesterday morning friday morning and, and the stuff i was reading oh maybe it was so this morning oh of course, friday i may morning have there is i, I may have heard ahead. about it last night yeah, so that's be. yeah because i was up pretty late so yeah. um all right so let's back up again we did talk not on the last episode but the episode before about Israel's attack on the Iranian embassy, embassy yes, complex in embassy, Damascus. Which is where all of this started. Yes. I would say that that was an unprovoked attack. Probably, Unlike yeah. the unprovoked Russian invasion of Ukraine, <laughs> this actually yeah. seems to have been unprovoked. <laughs> yeah. Right. The well, and, okay, but, and we so, talked about this on the last podcast. When you like attacking an embassy is the same as attacking the country. Yes. Um. So when you're because who were they were going after somebody that was in the embassy? Yeah, there was a general from the um, IRGC, the um, Iranian, you know, special ops kind of yeah. guard corps. Yeah. And uh, the Revolutionary Guard Corps. Um, yeah. That was there. That presumably was the target that they killed. Yeah, still is attacking an embassy. Yeah, well, that's that's I, I my know. point. Yeah. So, so, actually, so this the starting point of the story is that Israel attacked an embassy. Yes, <laughs> I, I actually want to go back even more because I kind of want to draw a contrast between the the Israeli unprovoked attack on the embassy and the Russian unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. Okay, it's, so. Because going back to 2008, no, and even more recently, so certainly since like 
2013, 2014, the U.S. and the Ukrainian government have been poking the Russian bear over and yeah. over and over again, just yeah. continuing to poke the Russian bear. And then when the Russian bear finally reacted to being poked over and over again, they yeah. said, oh, it was an unprovoked, unprovoked invasion. Yeah, yeah, right. But they'd been provoking him all the time. Now, unprovoked and justified are not the same thing, right? So I'm not yeah. saying that it was a justified attack. It was an unjustified attack also. So I could walk around and just start poking you on the shoulder all day long? Yes, and it would not be fair for me to slit your throat. All right. <laughs> well, then I won't right. do it then. Because <laughs> that's kind of the point that I was going to make. Is that, like yeah. If you go back even farther to when they were originally talking about Ukraine becoming a part of NATO, and, and then also you know, moving some weaponry into Ukraine and overthrowing the Ukrainian government that was um, more pro-Russian and so forth. Russia was saying all this time, like, you can't do this. You, you can't do this because if you continue to do this, I'm going to be forced to react, and I don't want to have to, Yeah. but I can't let this thing happen. It's like, it's like if I said to you, if you egg my house, I'm going to beat the hell out of you. All right. And then you go around and you egg my house. Not only did I egg your house, I salted your yard, too. Okay. <laughs> and then I beat the hell out of you. Yeah. Now, I don't think that beating the hell out of somebody for getting your house egged is justified. Yeah. But it also wasn't an unprovoked <laughs> what, what, attack what, what, by me on you after you egged my house and salted my yard. One because thing led not to only, another. <laughs> yeah. First off... Egging my house and salting my yard is a provocation, even yeah. if it's one that doesn't justify me beating you up. Yeah, all right. All right. And the other thing is, I told you the whole time. Yeah. Right. If you do this, yeah. I'm going to have to do this. Yeah. Which that is, to me, a big part of the problem here with, mm -hmm. with this incident, with Ukraine in particular, is that we are just, as, as a country, not willing to listen to the other side at all. Um, and that partly I blame that on our media. Um, but I think ultimately the government is to blame. Um, but like, I mean, there's no, like when Tucker Carlson went over there to talk to Putin, that was a big deal because nobody had talked to Putin from the U S yeah. like in this whole time period, here. including <laughs> Anthony Blinken. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I mean, it's like, there's no communication here at all. Um, and that's, that leads to these type of issues. Yeah. Including the chief diplomatic agent of the United States. Yeah. Like, I mean, if, if we wanted to be so involved in what's going on in Ukraine, like mm -hmm. the first thing we should have done was pick up a telephone. Yeah. Well, okay. So then we come around to this, um, Israel attacking the Iranian embassy. Now, what I'm frustrated about since then is, th okay, so that happened April 1st. Okay. On April, what would it, uh, 13th, it was Saturday, right? So April 13th, Iran finally responds. They send up lots of drones and many missiles. Yep. Um, they use slow-moving drones and enough missiles to get through, and they, they do some damage, but not any real significant damage. Yeah. Now, I would say that this was a, an attack that was planned to do very little damage, yeah. but to prove a point. To show that you're not immune to being hit. Yeah, that we can overwhelm your defense systems. Yeah, yeah. And they proved that they can. Yeah. Um, they didn't do much damage, uh, <laughs> but then the media says, and then Iran attacked Israel this weekend. <laughs> Well, okay, so if we go back to the original example, um, if you egg my house and I beat you up, I didn't attack you, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, well, that's what I'm going to say. I retaliated. Be like, Mike attacked me for no reason. <laughs> yeah, I retaliated against you, but the way the press is presenting it, it's like that attack on the embassy didn't happen. So yeah. the uh, Iranians attacked Israel in response to, but attacked Israel. Yeah. Now they will add that in response to, because we all know better. Yeah. But then they say that on Friday, Israel retaliated against the Iranian attack. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When the first, when the last one was a retaliation, like, right. Yeah. 
It's it's all just it's it's all propaganda. Mm-hmm. It is. We we've decided what side we're on, yeah. and so we're going to use language specifically to promote the one side and to make the other side to seem like they're the bad guys. Yeah. Um, and once and again, the other thing is that Iran had a a very measured response that was intended not to do any significant damage. I think um, because they are capable of doing significant damage if they yeah. want to. So they you just wanted they to can, make that clear. Yeah, they so you so just so so I understand. You think they can penetrate the iron, iron dome? Absolutely. Okay. I, I mean, think I, that they can just overwhelm the defenses. Yeah, yeah. Um I mean, and I, I think that I, I that's think the point that they were trying right. to prove. Yeah. Was and like this also, this is just a sample of what we can send over like if we because even our media is saying that they they have the ability to send a lot more than what they oh, sent. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, absolutely. Hezbollah could yeah. send a lot more than what Iran sent. Really? Okay. Just themselves. Yeah. Uh, so the other thing is that Iran notified everybody beforehand. Yeah, they <laughs> essentially, did. Yeah, I heard uh, that in- too, including yeah. Turkey, who's a NATO <laughs> member, who dutifully reported it to the United States. Everybody knew this attack was coming and when. Yeah. Um, they used kind of the least of their capabilities to do it. They mm. announced that it was happening while it was, you know, that it was. They announced it while it was still happening. They didn't even wait until it was over before they announced publicly that this is what we've done. Yeah. And then they also said that, and we consider the matter closed at this point, once again, before it was even done, just yeah. to say, like, look, okay, we're just making a point to you here because— yeah. You got to also remember that Iran has sat back and allowed Israel to do a lot of damage to them over the past many years, yeah. killing scientists, attacking nuclear sites, all kinds of stuff within Iran. Yeah. And they haven't responded. Yeah. And I, I think that they wanted to make it clear, like, there is a line at which you we yeah. cannot let it go. Like, yeah. we have to respond. Yeah. And you've crossed it now. So yeah. this is our response and we can let sleeping dogs lie now. It's been tit for tat. Okay. Yeah. None of us, neither of us have done really significant damage. Yeah. Let it go. Yeah. Which they didn't. Which they didn't. <laughs> Which that's what irritates me because everybody was telling Israel, all right, let it go. Yeah. Like, I mean, more or less, that's what everything coming out of the U.S. was. Um, like, I know Biden had, had said that. Like, it's in. It, what irritates me about that with them just being like, no, like we are going to retaliate again, back again, is that like, it'd be one thing if we were just telling them that and being like, Hey, you know, don't let's not go and do the, like, let's let it like leave it alone. This is good enough. We, we repelled everything, blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. Um, but like we support them like without yeah. us, they're they're I mean, their capabilities are drastically decreased without our support. So, there should be some kind of line there where, okay, if we ask them specifically not to re-retaliate, mm-hmm. they ought to listen. <laughs> well, there's there's some truth to that, certainly. Um, now, part of the reason that I really dislike, well, I don't like subsidizing anybody. Yeah. Um, I really dislike subsidizing Israel because I think that they're an oppressive state. And yeah. that they're going to draw us into something that we don't want to be a part of well, because, because they don't because, care. Because of just what I laid out, the yeah. fact that when we ask them to be restrained, they will not do it. Yeah. Netanyahu believes that he controls the U.S. government. Yeah. And he's not wrong. I, yeah. He's, he can make a good case. That's certainly true. Yeah. There's a there's a story. Um, I'm trying to think if I can bleep this out or if I, I'll just... <laughs> yeah. I'll just censor myself, I suppose. But there is a story that uh, after a meeting between Bill Clinton and um, Benjamin Netanyahu, that after Netanyahu left, uh, Bill Clinton said, does he know who the effing superpower is? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or like, who's the effing superpower? Yeah. Right? Because, you know, Israel's the tail that wags the dog. Yeah. Well, and that that is what it is. Like we may be the superpower, but I mean, they got us by the whatever. So, yeah. <laughs> like for whatever reason, like I don't completely understand it personally. Yeah. Well, that's among the things that has been pointed out here is that it, through this series of actions is that we help defend Israel against a retaliation strike. Yeah. Right. Um 
<laughs> We've also provided more support to them than we have Ukraine, which uh, Vladimir Zelensky seems to be really <laughs> upset about. <laughs> Um, that we have worked harder to defend Israel than we have to defend Ukraine, like actively involved ourselves in operations to defend Israel where we haven't yeah. done that against well, Ukraine. Well, well now, Ukraine's just a side check, though. Like, like, well, uh, well it, the real <laughs> difference is that um, actively defending Ukraine puts us directly in a war with Russia. Yeah. And actively defending Israel could put us directly in a war with Iran. Yeah, which which a, a good bit of the industrial complex has been boner and for, oh, for yeah, a yeah. long time. Absolutely, absolutely. There's a lot of people, a lot that of money to be made in that a war. war with Iran because yeah. it's a it's a war with a power that doesn't have nuclear weapons. Yep. Um, it would be a conventional war. Yep. Unless Israel goes nuclear, which is still a possibility. Yeah. Um, even though they don't officially have a nuclear program. They absolutely unofficially nobody, do. Yeah, nobody knows. believes that they don't, yeah. Um, the opposite of, is true of Iran for some reason, yeah. that everybody claims that they have a nuclear program unofficially <laughs> when they absolutely don't. Yeah. Uh, whatever, though, leaving that aside. <laughs> I, I don't even want to go down that rabbit hole right now. There's lots yeah. to read about that. I would highly recommend if... People believe that Iran has or ever has had an active nuclear program, where, by which I mean they were trying to construct a nuclear weapon. Yeah. There was a point where they were researching the possibility. Yeah. Um, but they have never attempted to construct a nuclear weapon and, and nix the program before they got to that point. If you have any questions about that, go read Manufacturing uh, Manufactured Crisis. Is that what it's called? I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Manufactured Crisis by Gareth Porter. It will dispel you of this myth. Yeah. Okay. It's a very convincing article. It's article book. It's kind of dry, yeah. but uh, there's a lot of information in there, and it kind of leaves you with no choice but to accept that Iran has never had a active nuclear construction program. Well, my understanding is is that that they believe it goes against the tenets of Islam. Yes. Yeah, um, both I mean that, the old so, Ayatollah uh, uh, Khomeini and yeah. Khomeini has reinforced the idea that use of mass casualty kind of weapons like that, yeah. um, nuclear, uh, biologic, uh, chemical, um, goes against the tenets of Islam because it cannot not target civilians. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's to me, that's almost good enough. I don't know. I mean, not that um, it's a theocracy. Well, that's what that's kind. Of, that's what I'm getting. That's the reason that I think that it's kind. Of, that to me, that's kind of good enough because, I mean, the with the fact that it's a theocracy kind of reinforces that. Mm -hmm. That like they, they can't really be saying that if it's and be doing something different. Yeah. It's not like our government where they can just say one thing and do another and get away with it. Like they think their God's going to get involved. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And they believe it. <laughs> Speaking of, just a little side note here. Break things up a little bit. All right. Um, we didn't really get to see the eclipse here because it was super cloudy uh, yeah. when it happened. I mean, there were some breaks in the clouds, which were actually the clouds provided the perfect filter. You didn't need any of those little glasses or whatever. Like the clouds filtered it. it just perfectly so that you could see. Yeah. But watching people's reactions to the eclipse in an yeah. age where we completely understand how eclipses happen. Yeah was just uh, it was very funny to me when you talk about a theocracy like you totally understand in a in an age watching people's reaction in an age where we understand how it happens makes you really understand why they were like you know <laughs> seeking virgins to sacrifice back in the old days because right. people were get, freaking out they, about they get this worked thing. up pretty quick don't yeah, they <laughs> it was kind of amazing i mean it's yeah. cool like yeah. it really is cool but yeah but wow. <laughs> yeah. Dude, dude, people are <laughs> This like, isn't a mystery. <laughs> yeah. Group think is scary. I'll just say yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. So um, anyway, that I it made me laugh. I like what I saw of it was neat to see. I've seen eclipses before. Yeah. I always think that they're cool because they're just yeah. kind of cool, but yeah. You imagine living somewhere with like we didn't have any clue what was happening to the sun all of a sudden. Yeah, like imagine this in <laughs> sub-Saharan Africa or something like today even. All right. Yeah. yeah. 
Oof. Anyway, it was it's just kind of funny to see people freak out over something that's so perfectly understood. I mean, think about all the, the stuff that was going around about that this was a sign of the end of the world in a time where we understand what's going on. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it's, been, it's been foreshadowed. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, off of that, <laughs> um, right. back to the Iran thing. Um, the I, Okay, so the purpose of all this is that Israel wants a war with Iran that— th- we get involved in that yeah. the United States gets involved. By the in. way, they've wanted this war since the nineties. Mm-hmm. Like this isn't just all of a yeah, sudden this isn't here. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, I, I don't think that they allowed the attack on October 7th to happen. Yeah. I think that they, I think it was hubris. I, I, I think that they felt so secure that they just weren't concerned and it bit them. Yeah. Um, but, Never get let a good crisis go to waste. This is an opportunity uh, for them to, with um, tensions very high and with the U.S. absolutely involved and promising to be on their side no matter what. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Biden's saying one thing to the American voter right now about Israel because the left <laughs> is so divided on this. Yeah. But to Netanyahu, he's saying, we got your back. Oh, yeah. He yeah. may be telling him, like, we don't approve of an attack of Iran or whatever, but he's saying he's pledging that we will put everything into defending Israel. And so what that means is to Netanyahu potentially is like, all right, well, we can t- attack Iran with impunity with our own forces because yeah. Israel is actually a rich nation with a very powerful military, all things considered, Yeah, uh, for their size. Yeah. Um, and we don't have to worry about the retaliations because the U.S. will take care of that for us. Absolutely. Well, and they they want that's a war they want to have anyway. Mm-hmm. And with the with the guarantees that we're going to back them in it, like there's no reason for them not to retaliate. They'd be stupid not to. Yeah. Um, what's been interesting is kind of seeing how other nations in the Middle East have reacted to this. I got a cat yeah. that's tracking something over there. I don't know what he's after exactly, but he's. He, he's, he was following something. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Jordan allowed the U.S. to use, I would say allowed the U.S. to use some of their defenses. They they took down some of the drones and stuff that fall, went through their airspace with the statement that they were protecting their own people. Yeah. But realistically, they were protecting They Israel. knew where the things were going. Yeah. yeah. Realistically, they were protecting Israel. I'm interested to see how the rest of the Muslim world reacts to Jordan do- siding with Israel and the U.S. on this. Yeah. Um, Saudi Arabia, despite the Abraham Accords and all that stuff, has been very purposefully neutral in all of this. Yeah. Has not gotten involved at all. Really? Yeah. Um, Lebanon and Yemen um, reportedly launched their own missiles to coincide with the uh, Iranian strikes. Yeah. Um, as far as I could tell, not in a way that seems like it was coordinated with Iran, but that they saw it happening and they were like, all right, well, we'll sure, we're doing some, it. Yeah, we'll launch some <laughs> of our own stuff too. Um, we'll throw in with you guys. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I don't know. It's, yeah. I'm kind of, I'm kind of interested to see where the where the loyalties lie. This is terrible though because it it you know becomes kind of the, like that World War One thing where everybody allies with somebody and suddenly it's a great big war. Your yeah. World War Three. Yeah. Um. I don't want to see that. Yeah. But uh, I don't know. It, I, I'm interested to see how all of the U.S.'s attempts at manipulating the loyalties in uh, the region. The, uh, yeah, kind of plays out. Yeah. Yeah. Which is I mean, like some like gallows humor kind of right. <laughs> stuff. But anyway, um I don't know. I it's uh I um I am a little frightened about where this goes. I don't think that it gets out of hand, but it's it's all in the hands of Israel and that frightens me. Yeah, that's that's what worries me the most because of all of the countries, they're by far the most reckless from what I've seen. <sighs> Um, because they can be, because they know that at the end of the day, the biggest bully has their back, you know, that being us. Yeah. <laughs> and frankly, they're kind of the biggest bully in the Middle East. They're the only nuclear power in the Middle East. Yeah. And they yeah. know that. Well, yeah, absolutely. 
Um, and so they feel like they can just push as far as they want. And if it ever comes down to it, they'll just drop a bomb. Yeah. Yeah. Because no, also everybody, you know, everybody that they might fight with is east of them. Yeah. Which is good news for them in terms of nuclear fallout. Of how, because of how the winds blow. Yeah, exactly. Like literally yeah. <laughs> because of how the winds blow. <laughs> right. Oh, that's an interest. I didn't know that, but that's an interesting little <laughs> tidbit yeah. there. So. Yeah. I mean, they would have problems with Egypt. Okay. Yeah. So conventional bombs on Egypt, everybody else gets <laughs> yeah, nuked. Everybody else gets a nuke. <laughs> so. And the U.S. would be like, uh, well, you know, they... Uh, well, Israel has a right to defend itself. Exactly. By God, God, I hate, I hate hearing that, dude. Mm-hmm. It's like, I just, ah, oh, it just, it irritates me. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I agree. Yeah. They have mm-hmm. a right to defend themselves. I, I agree with that, too. Apparently, they also have a right to oppress uh, a huge portion of their population and deny them rights. Yeah. Um, and they have a right to claim territory that's not theirs in contravention of international law and m- maintain occupation of it for 50 years without any consequence. Right. Um, and uh, despite all of that, they uh, have the right to have the Security Council support them. Yeah. And here we And are. by the Security Council, I mean the United States. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. Because uh, also... While the United States maintains that they would like to see a two-state solution as the as a um, as a resolution to this problem, the United States vetoed as the single no vote yeah. um, the uh, Palestinian petition to become a full UN member last week, or oh, really? maybe it was this week. Yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah, you, United States was the only no vote. Uh, the UK and somebody else abstained, and then everybody else voted for it, really? including France, by the way. <laughs> um, but since the uh, the permanent members of the Security Councils get gets a veto, yeah. the US vetoed as the sole nay vote um, Palestinian acceptance into the UN. Wow, <laughs> that's even yeah. though. We say that the two-state solution is the answer. <laughs> well, it is. The- that's just a lie. Yeah, yeah. So uh, anyway, that's yeah, that's where we are in the Middle East, I guess. Um, there was something else you wanted to talk about. Yeah. So, um, so the the, um, the hush money case is going on in New York for Donald Trump. Right oh my now. God! Who cares? <laughs> well, there there was something <laughs> I found interesting about it this week. So. So Trump's basically like in New York right now. So instead of like out on the campaign trail, trail like I mean, he's still doing campaign stops and stuff too, but spending a lot of time in New York. So while he's there, why don't he do a little campaigning? Why not? Right. I'm here. Um, and he's like a native New Yorker, like he's a New York guy. So he went down to Harlem the other day. He's such a native New Yorker. Dude, well, it's, <laughs> well, it really like came out when I was watching some of the videos of him in Harlem. I don't know why, just something about it's like, dude, like this guy's comfortable here. Like he just, he just seems like, like he fits in. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so he was in, um, Harlem and, um, so he visited, uh, the bodega of uh, Josh or Jose Abada, Abada, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, he's the one that was wrongfully accused, or wait, he was the one who was robbed. And um, uh, well, here I'm just gonna read the thing. Okay. Um, so um, yeah, Trump visited Harlem Bodega in New York City, where Jose Abada, probably pronouncing that wrong, a bodega clerk, was robbed, attacked, and ultimately wrongly accused of murder by a Soros-funded DA, Alvin Bragg, after being forced to defend his life. That's a Trump post, by the way. Okay. <laughs> so just so you, the little Soros-funded things always slipped in there. All right. Um, um, is this the guy the, who, uh, the the guy went behind the counter and grabbed him to try and pull him out to apologize to his girlfriend or something like that? Is that that case? I believe it is. Like, okay. I'm not, not positive, but what what's... What's interesting to me about this whole deal is, is that like New York's a rough place right now. Like New York's got a lot of 
problems with crime and <laughs> to that's, the pre Giuliani days. Yeah, well, it, well, basically, <laughs> Not that I support no, Giuliani. Please but it, don't it's funny that, that you mentioned that though, because mm. I don't think Trump mentioned Giuliani specifically. But mm. in those videos where he was talking to the press, like he was very like Giuliani like as far as like we're going to clean this city up. Like mm. if I'm president, things are going to change here. Like like and and he of course Alvin Bragg is the the prosecutor that's prosecuting him right, right. now in his case. That, that's a that's a savvy political move. It's to, a very savvy political move because the guy that's going after me is not protecting you. Yeah. Um, and is actually in a lot of cases when you try to protect yourself going after you. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's just good politics. What was the guy um, that uh, was accused of murder for um, killing that guy on the subway that was threatening people? Do you remember that case? The guy was a vaguely. Uh, um, he was uh, a vet. I think. Yeah. Um, wait, I mean, he's, he definitely been in the armed forces. He may still have been active. I can't remember. Yeah. Um, but he ended up choking the guy to death yeah. on the subway that had been threatening other people. And then he was accused of murder. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Charged of charged, charged with, murder. with murder. Yeah. Um, hmm. um, so yeah, like I say, it's, I don't know. I just kind of wanted to draw attention to yeah. kind of what's going on with Trump right now. Well, I mean, you know, and that's uh, that's fairly typical government as far as I can tell in a lot of, especially in um, heavy, heavy blue cities. Yeah. Is that uh, we're not going to protect you and you're not allowed to protect yourself. Yeah, exactly. Um, mm. And people aren't going for that. Like, um, no, why would anybody well, go for that? But it, 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 and <laughs> Unless you, you're a criminal. Yeah, if you if I'm just saying if you're one of these lefties that just can't seem to figure out why Trump is polling so well, mm -hmm. like this is it. Like yeah. this this right here, like just him going to Harlem and by the way, like I say I know it was like a planned campaign stop or whatever, but he could barely speak to the to the reporters and stuff for the shouting of four more or yeah, whatever it was, like pro Trump. Four more years. Yeah, or... yeah, just constantly the whole time every time he would speak like overwhelming in the background. Mm -hmm. So I mean, there's something to that, like, because it's not like he was in particularly fr friendly areas. It's not like he was down south here somewhere. Can you imagine if New York voted Trump in the 2024 election? I mean, I don't want to wow. go out on a limb and say that that's what's going to happen, but I think he's going to have a good showing. And yeah. I mean, you know, it's it's interesting, like that. What's the, the way politics is playing out? If right Washington now is just, State goes Trump, then we know that like the world <laughs> is going to end. That's right. a better sign than the uh, than, than the than, eclipse. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, if uh, Washington yeah. State votes Trump, there's there's more scientific data <laughs> data behind that, right? <laughs> yeah. Oregon maybe too. Yeah. Um, so. Although you know, okay. What's funny about it, it's. I mean, I guess it's just really like all the others, except maybe California. California actually has a huge just percentage of people throughout the state that are mm. uh, left wing. Yeah. I hear that was, you, buddy. That We're was wrapping up. Geared towards me. Oh, okay. <laughs> He's like, where's your wife? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but uh, so, like, Washington State, Seattle yeah. is very, very blue, obviously. Yeah. And there, I, I guess that there's kind of a mix throughout the state, but Oregon is a weird one to me because Portland is very blue. Yeah. But the rest of the state <laughs> but Portland's, isn't really. <laughs> yeah, the Portland's kind of the outlier. <laughs> yeah, it seems to me. I mean, I could be wrong about this. I, I've never lived out there. Yeah. So maybe I have it wrong, but like Oregon's like a logging community. <laughs> You know, right. I just can't imagine that not a lot of loggers for Biden. That that most of the most of Oregon is rural, rural, yeah. and I can't imagine that rural Oregon is very left wing. I, I don't know. I yeah. I could be wrong. I, I can't picture that, but who knows? But the so. you know the concentration of the population is in Portland, and yeah, so they get the biggest say. Yeah, yeah. I mean that's how New York New York works. Like New York City dominates. 
New York elections. Yeah. I mean, there's a whole lot of upstate New York that is which not is the, left wing. Which is the reason him being stuck in New York right now with this case isn't bad for him. Well, like I, say, I, I mean, that's it's true. Given, given him an opportunity to do some campaigning in a city that he knows and is comfortable in. Yeah. Um, like I say, because that was watching the videos. That was my biggest takeaway. It's like, like he's at home here. Like mm-hmm. he's this, this is his place. Like, and yeah. he, it just oozes off of him. God, he's such a New Yorker. So, yeah. That's uh, a reason not to vote for him as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> no. Um, well, that concludes my weekly Trump report. I was born in New Jersey. We don't like New York. So. Oh yeah. Is there, <laughs> is there a bit of a, <laughs> well, Dave Smith moved from New York to New Jersey. Yeah. Right? We wouldn't like him. <laughs> oh yeah. So he's a, he's a traitor then. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. The transplants, they're not appreciated. Okay. Go back to New York. <laughs> Go back to New York. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> oh, can't tell I'm from New Jersey anymore. I spent way too much time in the South. Yeah. Like, I never really picked up the New Jersey accent, but I didn't. There was a long time that I didn't sound like such a Southerner that I sound like now. Like my uh, accent yeah. has definitely. I lived with a guy from Bremen, Georgia, for years. Yeah, and that guy changed my accent. Oh yeah, yeah. The yeah. the West Georgia accent just sunk in. Like you couldn't. <laughs> yeah. Couldn't avoid it. Oh well. It, there's nothing I can do about it now except okay. move, I guess. Just, just embrace it. Um, all right. So we've got like maybe 10 minutes. Uh, and we did talk about, or oh, yeah, mentioned we... briefly, the protectionist stuff. Uh, I, I just I just wanted to talk about the protectionism thing. Because the <gasps> the story about protectionism in this country is that it saves American jobs and, you know, well, that's it, right? Yeah, like, I mean that's that's the that's the idea is that you're you're protecting protecting good American jobs mm-hmm. made in America. And I just want to express to people what protectionism really does. You mean it does? You mean it doesn't do that? Oh, protect people's jobs. It it does that. Yeah. Um, it's special interest, though. I mean, it's not like it, tech, it protects all American jobs. It's like saying that war is good for the American economy because they spend a whole lot of money into the, you know, military contractors. I mean, I think well, that doesn't a, help all of us. I was going to say that I only think, helps a select few people. I think that there's a definitely an argument to be made. That's kind of what our economy's hedged on right this, now. Yeah, that is the American economy, isn't it? Um, it what do we do is. best? Well, we so I asked you before the co- killing I asked, stuff. I asked you before the podcast what we built, and really, I guess that's the answer. Yeah, we build missiles, missiles, and warships, and warplanes. Yeah, I don't even know that we're that great at that stuff. We could probably outsource that, and do it cheaper and better. <laughs> All right, but we don't. But we don't. <laughs> um, but. Yeah, that's kind of the point is that like, okay, sure, that uh, that creates some American jobs in a very specific industry. Yeah. And the profits are absorbed by a very specific industry that uses those proceeds to produce things that aren't consumed in the U.S. Yeah. Which yeah. makes it a, a bleed on American wealth, actually. Yeah. So, um, so that's the problem with the military and industrial complex. With protectionism, generally, you kind of have the same sort of thing. It's not quite the same because sometimes you are producing products that are consumed within the U.S. And in fact, yeah. I guess a lot of times you're producing products that are consumed within the U.S. But yeah. um, what it does, though, is that it uh, makes the price for all consumers in the U.S. higher. Yeah. And if you're talking about like something like a steel industry, yeah, then... It also makes all the products that consume that product cost more too. Which is a lot when it yeah. comes to steel. <laughs> um, and you're propping up an American business that's not competitive. Yeah. And this is something that, that I complained about a, a couple of podcasts ago, I think, when we were talking about some economic stuff. And I said, you know, what what you're doing is you're creating a situation where the, it is more valuable for a business rather than to improve their product and improve their prices to take the money that they do have and go lobby the government to prop them up. Yeah. (laughs) And that's at your expense too, because it takes a bureaucracy to maintain whatever protectionist policies that you've got. So now your tax money is being used to protect 
a poor American business that would rather spend the money that it does extract from you to pay your politicians to extract more money from you to protect their business that they don't do very well because they're not competitive with the rest of the world. <laughs> because they're using all their money to lobby <laughs> instead of to... To improve whatever. their product. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so, okay, sure, there's lots of things that can be produced cheaper elsewhere. Yeah. Well, then produce a better product here. Yeah, yeah. Right. Like, so one of I mean, the things that we complain a, about the, with China, right, is like, well, it's cheap, but it's crap. All right. Well, make a better one here. The problem yeah. is, and this is the example I was talking with my mom about this last night. The example I used was Japanese auto, autos. Yeah. All right. So there was a time where you used to be able to say in this country, and it was a long time ago yeah. now, where you could say, all right, well, but the Japanese products are cheaper, but the American products are better. Yeah. Not anymore. Oh, no. Yeah. Now the Japanese products are cheaper and better. And they're better. Yeah. Yeah. Give me that Japanese. And so you end up with a bunch of import restrictions. So there's only so many Japanese autos that can be imported into this country every year, uh, plus really high tariffs to make their prices higher so that the American companies that are producing a pork product at a higher price can compete. Yeah. Yeah. Instead, they should just make a better vehicle. Right. And you've also, like, beyond. You know, as a corollary, I guess, to incentivizing them to spend their money on lobbying instead of improving their product, yeah. you you make it so that there's no drive to be more competitive. Yeah, like there's no reason for them to be more competitive yeah. because they're being propped up by government policy. Yeah, to protect their business, yeah. and you can say that all right, well, but what about those workers? And I get that. That's an understandable concern. Yeah. Thank you. (laughs) Searching for a word there. Um, That's an understandable concern. But why should we... uh, So all resources are scarce. Yeah. Including labor. Yep. Why should we waste our labor laboring for a business that's not competitive instead of using that labor in a business that is competitive. Yeah. So essentially you're drawing labor into an industry where it probably shouldn't be in this country. Well, and instead of that labor being used to do something that's really productive and helpful to Americans, something that we can produce at a lower price or a higher quality, you're they're languishing in a business that can only compete by artificially raising prices of everybody else. Yeah. Well, and every, or limiting the supply of yeah. everybody else because there's import restrictions, you know, oh, yeah. like quotas and stuff. Yeah. Right. No, the consumer loses at every end. Yeah. Because so so now you're not letting as many of those foreign vehicles in or whatever, mm-hmm. and the ones that we're making suck. Yeah. And there's no incentive to make them better. <laughs> and the the, when, uh, the price is artificially raised. Yeah. On all products. All of them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Whether you're buying foreign or domestic. Yeah. So. Um, so the, the consumer's paying more for the product itself and they're paying through taxes to maintain the bureaucracy, to maintain their higher price. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's government run amok. Yeah. Like, I mean, that's, that's in, in all areas. Mm-hmm. And if your concern is that, well, we just can't produce products at that price here. Well, yeah. that's because of government too. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Government has artificially raised the price of labor. Yeah. In this country, through all the requirements on employers to provide this, that, and the other. Yeah. And it may sound good to you, but it's not. Yeah. Because at the... So some people get paid more um, because of this, but everybody pays more for the product. Yeah. So it's only a limited group that actually benefits from that side of it, from the increased wages and so forth. Yeah. Um, it's a limited group that benefits from that while everybody else pays more for all their consumer goods. Wouldn't you rather get $2 an hour and still be paying 50 cents for a cup of coffee Exactly. than so get paid $30 an hour but pay $12 for a cup of coffee? And that's kind of the point I was going to make is that the reason all of this is in effect, it all goes back to the government devaluing the money. Mm -hmm. Because if if the money wasn't devalued, there wouldn't be a reason to force employers to pay X amount. Well, and the the reason that they had to devalue the money is because that's the only way they can afford all of the bureaucracy to do all of this (laughs) is by just printing more money. Exactly. And that creates inflation. Yeah. Exactly. So I mean, it's it's 
Uh, it, it all goes back at the end of the day to the inflation. Mm-hmm. Um, like I say, it's it's but it's government run the muck. I mean, it really goes back to just government getting involved in the market in ways that it just shouldn't be involved. Where if you had a, a solid libertarian society type society, yeah, like you just wouldn't run into these type of issues. Mm-hmm. A, a problem that's created by government intervention in the market cannot be solved by government intervention in the market. Yeah. By no. further government intervention no. in the market. It's, you're just digging yourself a hole. What we need that would improve everything. And it would take some time. There would be an adjustment period. Oh, it'd be I'm bumpy. not saying yeah. um it, just watch what's going on in Argentina. Yeah. So I haven't paid that close. <laughs> I, I, so. Yeah, we need to Come we back should, around to that. Um, yeah, we should maybe we'll talk about on that, that on the next podcast. But yeah. uh, there's already like there's been problems. Prices jumped. Yeah. Um, but they're already like the market is already resolving a lot of the problems. Yeah. Um, and that's what would happen here uh, if you just got government out of the way. Get government out of the way and let people innovate and compete and produce. Yeah. And it would be a benefit to all of us. Yeah. And it wouldn't take that long. It would be rough. I've, I've always kind of figured like the first couple of years would be rough. Mm-hmm. Like, cause all of the adjustments happening in the system and whatnot. Yeah. As, once, it, as it finds its equilibrium. Yeah. It as be, it would, but it would yeah. do, I feel like it would do it pretty quick. Mm-hmm. And then once it did, we'd be in such a more stable place. Yeah. All government interventions in the market, none of them are ever, just like when I was talking about, oh, by the way. Okay. So I did. Um, I did get a note from somebody about Dow Chemicals, I think it was, yeah. um, competing with German companies and, and undercutting with prices. I think there was a misunderstanding on one side or the other, and I haven't really gotten a look into it about what I was claiming um, last week about yeah. uh, companies cutting their prices to take a loss to get everybody to out of the flush market. flush the market, yeah. Yeah. Um, Address that next. I'm gonna make a note. I'll address that next week, maybe too, because I haven't really gotten a look into the example that was given. Okay. So I appreciate that comment. And, and further research is, is required. Yeah, further research is required. <laughs> I do really recommend people if you want to get a message to me to email me at Michael at the Liberty Mike.com because I do not check Facebook. Oh yeah. <laughs> I just no. I just don't. It's just not I I, I actually ran into the guy who sent the message the other day. It's the only reason I knew it was there. <laughs> you even knew it existed. Yeah. yeah. Or I would find out tonight when we upload the podcast, yeah. Yeah. Um, the new podcast. So yeah. I guess I'm always a week behind if you're going to try and contact me on Facebook. Yeah. Um, if you send me an email, I get that every day. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Michael actually checks his. He and doesn't I actually have, check my He doesn't emails. have 20,000. I them too. Yeah. He doesn't have 20,000 <laughs> unread ones. Um, oh, I don't remember where I was going before I got sidetracked on that. Uh, yeah. Oh. oh well, I don't know. Something about what we need is a free market. That's the that's the kind of the end result. Yeah. What we need is a free market. Just let let people compete and produce and innovate and do what they can. And oh yeah, it was about um, the legislation, including because of the antitrust legislation. I was oh, saying yeah. that the antitrust legislation is never used to benefit the consumer. It's always used to benefit special interests. Yeah. And that's true of all economic legislation, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. I mean, there might be like the odd legislation once in a while in the reams and reams and reams of economic legislation that's out there. There might be a few that yeah. actually benefited consumers. But the people that get in there and get legislation pushed through are special interests that it benefits them, not you. Yep. Absolutely. And that's what's true of protectionist policies as well. Like yeah. even if you work in that industry, yeah. it doesn't actually benefit you. Yeah. Um, we're just propping up bad business yeah. and, and at taxpayer expense. Yeah. So um, anything else? Cause we're uh, pushing over an hour now. So got to wrap up. I think we covered everything. All righty. In that case, um, well, we'll be back next week on Friday again. Yep. Oh yeah. We'll be Friday again. Uh, yeah. Um, I gotta make some weird arrangements to make that work, but that, that'll be fine. I'll make right. it happen. Right. Um, so we'll be back on Friday again. Ugh, man, we may as well just declare that the permanent day. I've been saying that, but I know, but I like to have the option of Thursday and I don't like, 
I don't like recording and then not releasing the podcast for a day just to hit the schedule. I know that yeah. that's beneficial for us yeah. in terms of numbers. I know that people like s- schedule their weeks around these things. Yeah. I get it. I understand. Podcast listening. Yeah. But like we're topical. We, you know, we're, we're talking about, uh, an attack <laughs> that happened, uh, 14 hours ago or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I don't like holding things. Yeah. Even though I know that it, it probably benefits us in the long run, but that's not the point. Yeah. I mean, if you guys really want to listen to us, you'll listen to us whenever we put out a podcast. <laughs> yeah. <right? laughs> Which will be on Friday. Come on guys. <laughs> um, all right. Well, but anyway, uh, Definitely. certainly next week is Friday. Absolutely. And, um, in the meantime, you can follow us on Facebook, but don't send me a message there. Email me, Michael at the Liberty Mike.com. <laughs> or do it just to annoy you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I will get it. It'll just be a week. It'll be a week. Yeah. Um, unless, unless Liberty Larry tells me about it, but if it's a private message, he won't be able to. Yeah. I don't have access to those accounts. Nope. <laughs> Because you're not the government. No, I'm not. <laughs> not yet. And I'm not technically a journalist, probably. <laughs> uh, so anyway, but yeah, we'll be back next Friday. Um, you can follow us on Facebook, subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, Podbean, uh, like and share, comment, subscribe. Um, yeah, uh, you can leave reviews. All those things. All those things help. All the things. And we really appreciate it. And uh, so, but we'll be back next week when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life short, live free. Ciao. Later.